The vast stretches of Canada are often falsely thought to be a land without history, a place humans have inhabited for only a few centuries. But Indigenous peoples here have always maintained that their ancestors inhabited these lands long before that. But tracking the ancestors' movements is a puzzle that can be difficult to piece together, thanks in part to a dramatically shifting landscape. But now, a team of archaeologists are using specialized tech to find caves along the British Columbia coast, where there are missing pieces just waiting to be found. Oh yeah. Could what's hiding in the bare earth be enough to change this narrative? From minuscule crevices on a coastal rock face to underground labyrinths, caves can be dark, mysterious, and often creepy holes to the unknown. But they also offer shelter from the elements, which is why they've played host to animals and humans the world over. My name is, uh, legal name is David Henius, and my uh, native name, chieftain name is Yekuklas. Back a long time ago when the flood happened, they say that the Quetzino people went into the caves and survived living underwater in the caves. Um, some went into canoes. Uh, but the uh, caves was another lifesaver for the Quetzino people. What sheltered humans and animals over the years has often also kept their remains safe. Members of the Quetzino Nation are anxious to see what the archaeologists find in the caves on their territory. To me, it's another um, way of uh, proving that our people have been here that long and longer, and uh, confirms what our legends have been saying. But in a landscape that has seen shorelines shift hundreds of feet and millennia of dirt and debris settle, ancient caves that once looked hospitable and that were easily accessed can be just about impossible to find today. Caves are difficult to find because often they're located in very steep uh, vegetated terrain. Uh, that most uh, sane people would prefer not to wander into. To find caves, it helps to look for sinkholes, which indicate karst caves below. Karst terrain forms when limestone is dissolved from rainwater and streams. It's best characterized by underground drainage systems. But with all these trees in the way, it's hard to see anything. So the archaeologists have partnered up with the Hakai Institute's Airborne Coastal Observatory, a plane with a payload of cameras and LIDAR lasers. LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. The laser scanner measures the distance from the plane to the ground and can virtually strip away the forest to reveal a bare earth model of the landscape below. At Duncan's request, pilot Robin Stewart and LIDAR specialist Steve Beffert flew over an area of Quetzino territory on Vancouver Island earlier this year, using the data to create bare earth maps for the archaeologists. Duncan and his team have investigated dozens of caves in British Columbia over the last two decades, but they've never had this kind of advantage before. In the area we're in right now, we got quite excited because we saw all these dome-shaped limestone landforms and we know that some of these limestone domes have ancient caves in them that were cut maybe millions of years ago. Instead of spending weeks or months on the hunt for caves, the archaeologists are now able to quickly go right to a cave identified on the bare earth map. Duncan's team includes karst management experts and Quatsino archaeological field workers. With map in hand, they all head out to where X marks the spot. They're looking for two things. First, evidence of ancient animals that could help the archeologists better understand what the environment was like all those years ago, and whether or not humans would have had access to food and other resources that they would have needed to survive. And if they're really, really lucky, they're also hoping to find direct evidence left by ancient humans themselves. The LIDAR maps have led them here to Gooseberry Cave, you take a meter of sediment away from the entrance and you can almost stand going in. Exactly. 
It doesn't look like much from the outside, but that's because over thousands and thousands of years, sediment has built up all around the cave as the landscape shifted. Okay, so this is the unit we've done at the far back of one of the tubes. And we've done it here because often in these very tight spaces, smaller mammals like to den. And so we frequently find bone here. And so in this particular place, we found a lot of fish bone on the surface. So here is an example of a tooth we've pulled. Some we know for sure are bare, and this one we're not actually entirely sure of. We know it's an incisor, possibly from a small mammal. Finding teeth and bone fragments from large predators and their prey tells us the landscape from that time must have been extremely fruitful, with vegetation lush enough to support a diverse ecosystem. It also suggests that humans could have thrived here too. On their first scouting mission to Gooseberry Cave, their research was quickly rewarded. I was carefully looking at the floor of the cave as we went through. My eyes were very close to the ground, and as I crawled past this, I saw these flake scars, uh, which are a tellmark sign that this is a chipstone artifact. And, um, you know, this is a pretty rare find. We don't find too many spear points uh, along the coast. So we were very excited to come across this. The artifact can't be aged directly using radiocarbon dating because that technique only works on organic material, like bone or charcoal. When you begin to excavate and you find things that are in situ or in place, you can take date sample from something organic above that artifact, if it's stone, and below as well, and get a better idea of when that artifact was put there. So it's very important to find things in context the team will send samples of charcoal and teeth to the lab to get an approximate age for the spear point. They also take special precautions to sample for ancient DNA. It will take months to get the results back, but in the meantime, they've struck gold again. Oh, wow, gorgeous flake. No. Yeah. Oh. Right oh. on top of the clay. No. Yeah. Oh yeah. I haven't seen anything like that. When an archaeologist is, is as excited as we just heard, it's a, it's a real flake. But how can they be sure it's a tool instead of a naturally broken rock? There are very specific features on a rock that tell us that it's been modified by humans versus being bashed around by other rocks or just by environmental conditions. You have to hit a rock at exactly the right point to result in these types of fractures. It's good that this kind of work is being done and it is um, enabling us to um, prove what we have been saying and prove um, our legends to be true with finding the actual um, evidence and carbon dating it and to um, prove that um, we are the actual uh, first inhabitants of this territory. Thanks to the bare earth maps created by the Airborne Coastal Observatory crew, and after extensive excavation work, the team have now found ample evidence of lush ancient environments and unmistakably human-made artifacts discoveries that hold great value for the Quatsino Nation and that will help in the future of karst land stewardship on Vancouver Island. The rest of their work will happen in the lab, so they've backfilled their excavation sites to leave them as they found them and head for home. And now, after months of patiently waiting, they've got the radiocarbon results which have dated charcoal associated with the spear point back more than 10,000 years, meaning the spear point was left in the cave in the period of time just after the last ice age, once the glaciers had receded from this area. The missing puzzle pieces are here, hiding in the cracks and crevices of our bare earth. All we have to do is look for them. <laughs>